Friends, thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor to be sitting at the helm here, knowing I won't always be sitting at the helm. One day, one of you or many of you will converge and carry on this word. I, I just think it's too important. You're a smart audience who have listened to me, some of you for 20 plus years. Uh, some of you, you're brand new, welcome. This is a format that I enjoy because it's, it's more personal. On television, uh, it's much different than it is here on this set. I'll see you guys in the morning. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, it's much different in that there's no communication. How many of you have watched me on television, know the cause, it's been on for you know 22 consecutive years, and said, man, I wish I could ask Doug about mm, fill in the blank. That's why three years ago I started this, and it's been quite successful, not thanks to my voice. It would be falling in space somewhere if it weren't for the technology enabling it to align with you, your computer, your phone, et cetera. So I sure appreciate you uh, being here with me and letting me continue this, continue this education. Folks, I gotta tell you, 22 years ago when I started this, I'll never forget, I'll never forget the two guys uh, sitting there saying, what's your show gonna be about? We're very excited to have you on, uh, buying airtime on this network. What's your show about? And I said, fungus. One of them looked at the other one and said, okay, there's a week. What is the next week gonna be about? No, no, the whole show is gonna be a, about fungus. Fungi are either saprophytes, that means they eat dead or decaying material, <clears throat> right? Uh, or they're parasites, they live inside our body. And they're opportunistic parasites. And what that means is when the opportunity is correct, when your immune system goes like this, or you're so angry about that car wreck, or your husband, or your wife, or your kids, and so your immunity begins to wax and wane, and while it's down here, fungus is opportunistic. It'll take over. And it is indiscriminately pumped by your heart to any area in your body. So this is important work. I think this is the most important course that every physician misses in their medical training. Case in point, MedPage. Uh, I really like MedPage. This is a bunch of doctors <clears throat> and they don't agree with much of what I believe nor do I agree with everything they believe, but I'm a guy who can walk in the middle of the road and pick here when I need it and here when I need it. I have friends who are alive today because of organ transplant. I have friends who are here today, no, uh, I have acquaintances who are here today because an arm could be sewed on. Miraculous what emergency medicine can do or medicine can do in general. And then I know I have loved ones who are gone because of medicine. Wrong drug, oops, mistake. Uh, oh, that drug we now realize is blows out the kidneys. We're gonna put a black box warning, what? Which side do you believe in? Because I think there's a lot of merit to each side. And sometimes there's total nonsense to one side and the other side looks pretty good. To me, exercise just went out, <clears throat> excuse me, did my 22 minutes. Uh, kicked me hard today. I believe that the proper diet, I believe that um, stress reduction works, I believe that the right supplements work, etc. Here on MedPage today, an organization I like, mostly all doctors, but they open the venue for uh, we, the people, to talk also. Uh, John, let's put this up. I want you to grab the title here. Can you, can you guys see that title? Can you read that, John? Okay, you got that title? That's important, it's on MedPage. <clears throat> it was yesterday. By the way, Berkeley turned six yesterday. My dear, 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 dear little grandson. Doc said it was cancer. She didn't believe them, and she was right. <clears throat> what a 60-year-old refugee taught me about skepticism of medical professionals. Amoebiasis, amoebiasis, wow. This is written by a doctor named Robert Graham. <clears throat> John, do you know why my voice is leaving me? I got a haircut today, and when I walked into the barbershop, I had to wait a few minutes. I go to a local guy here. He had um, bubble gum. Remember the old bubble gum we used to get? with? Yeah, 
and I took a piece of that bubble gum and chewed it up. <clears throat> I don't normally eat sugar, but man, did my voice begin playing tricks on me. It was so good. And at 70 years old, I'm glad I can chew on these teeth. So good. It must have been a, a, a quart of sugar. <clears throat> so my voice gave way. The public wants to believe in the profession of medicine. These beliefs are often justified, but not always. You talk about a humble writer. For example, one day a 60-year-old woman came to emergency department for abdominal pain, a refugee from El Salvador. She was admitted to a team of doctors and medical students at a, a county setting. The supervising uh, attending physician on that team was an oncologist. Wow. He held the high position on the medical school that was affiliated with this hospital. <clears throat> the members of the team examined this woman and ordered a CT scan of her abdomen. In their notes, they wrote the CT showed a mass in her liver. A biopsy was taken and sent to pathology department. It was put on slides and an expert pathologist who also worked with the medical school looked at it, as did residents who were studying to be pathologists. They saw abnormal cells. They said those cells were the cells of liver cancer, and the official report from pathology department came back liver cancer. Nevertheless, <clears throat> since the biopsy showed cancer, they assumed she had cancer. They told her she needed chemotherapy. However, this woman didn't believe that she even had cancer. This was an interesting position for her to take. She was uneducated. She was from the countryside of El Salvador, El Salvador, El Salvador, say that 20 times. She was raised on a farm in a hut with no electricity, no running water. She told the doctor she didn't have cancer. The doctors told her that she did have cancer. She told them she wanted to leave. They told her if she leaves, she would be dead. She said that uh, she would take her chances. They made her sign out against medical advice, or AMA. Ironic, huh? I reviewed all the records, says this doctor, when I saw this woman a year later. She returned to the emergency department at the time because she was still having abdominal pain and was losing weight. In addition to reviewing her records, I looked at the CT scan that, they, that was done the year before. But what I saw surprised me. It was not a mass that looked like cancer. Rather, it was a mass that was primarily a cyst. Uh, they call this amoebiasis. It's an amoeba infection uh, called by, uh, caused by ento, where are my notes? Histolytica, entomoeba histolytica. And it causes a condition called amoebiasis. And what that means is there's an amoeba that can parasitize a person just like fungus, and it can get on throughout your body. <clears throat> As I reviewed her record, she had no risk for cancer. Those risk factors uh, are anything that chronolog uh, chronically damages the liver, such as liver hepatitis, alcohol abuse. This patient didn't have chronic hepatitis. She didn't have ap uh, alcohol abuse. There was no reason why she should have primary liver cancer, and yet it was diagnosed, hepatocellular carcinoma. A test of this woman's stool showed that she indeed had an amoeba. Amoeba is a parasite that can form with contaminated water. The woman drank from ponds and streams in El Salvador. Amoeba can migrate into the intestine to the liver where it forms a cyst. This woman never, okay, this I love. Listen to how humble this author is, this Dr. Robert Graham. This woman never had cancer. She, had she gotten chemotherapy, she would have probably died. Treating a patient with chemo when they have a serious underlying infection would likely cause that infection to kill. Uh, but had she died in that manner, the doctors would have said she died from liver cancer. No one would have ever known the truth. I got to tell you, um, then he begins to talk about the mistakes. Mistakes made with this patient also happen in the culture of medical education. Doctors get promoted in academic medicine for doing research and publishing papers. Excellent teaching and good care of your patients aren't reliable ways to get promoted. This case is probably an example. Um, the supervising physician did not t take time to look at this t the CT scan. He took the resident's word for what it showed. Uh, folks, there are so many things. As a matter of fact, 
there's so many things I have to say about this. I actually somewhere here, if I remember to bring it, <clears throat> and of course I didn't. I wrote in response to this, and it's got to be on my copier over there, and you know what I said? <clears throat> I said this was one of the most honest medical write-ups I've ever seen. It's the most humbling thing to read. This says whoops. It simply says whoops. The patient was right. Can you imagine these oncologists and these medical personnel and the lab personnel, how they laughed at her and signed her out against medical advice, and they told her what they perceived to be the truth. If you don't take this chemo, you're going to be dead. You know, my question is, okay, just <laughs> do me a favor. I prepared a one-pager here. That means you believe if I do take the chemo, I'll live. Would you just sign that for my lawyer to see? Um, Folks, we're at, a, we're at an interesting place in medicine today. <clears throat> I told you about this, and once again, darn if I didn't leave it over sitting on my desk. I told you about the journal Lung. The journal Lung published in 2013 a retrospective study. They looked at all these studies. And when they went back and really studied all these, and some of them were from right here, uh, MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, Texas, the big cancer center. Some of them were from overseas. But a case series was presented of 27 patients diagnosed with lung cancer. You have lung cancer. They had already intervened on 14 of those and started cancer therapy. And then further testing was done. Later, this lung cancer proved to be lung fungus, and all 27 got better with antifungal drugs. We need to talk a little bit about the mistakes that happen in medicine. This doctor humbled himself and said, we made a mistake. A 60-year-old woman from El Salvador, uneducated woman, knew she didn't have cancer. How many times have you been to the doctor and you knew this wasn't a bacterial infection, but you knew doctors are trained to write prescriptions for antibiotics? I've been there. The one time, this was three years, two and a half years ago, that I knew I had a bacterial problem. I knew exactly what to do. If I'd have thought this was lung fungus or a, a throat infection caused by fungus, I wouldn't have gone to the doc in the box. I would have tried to find somebody to give me nice statin or to give me Diflucan. They don't know, folks, how to prescribe those drugs. Fungus isn't something that's expounded upon in their medical education. Oh, bacteria is all over the place. But that one study from 2013 <clears throat> opened my eyes so clearly as to the mistakes that are being made in medicine. In 2014, there was a man who had tongue cancer. It later turned out to be, uh, as I recall, an aspergilloma. The thing I want to point out to you is just like this parasite, this amoeba that got into this woman's lung or her intestine, <clears throat> probably started in her intestine, did it say it formed a mass? Fungus forms a lump. What do you think these 27 patients had in their lungs to indicate on an x-ray that that patient had lung cancer? There was a mass. There was a ball. Fungus and cancer are very difficult to differentiate. Very difficult. But it isn't difficult when all you own is a hammer. There's no screws. All you own is a hammer, and the patient sitting in your waiting room and in the street below and in your city are nails, not one screw, and you own a hammer. When you learn that way, boy, a lump in the breast, oh, that's cancer. Back up. What else could it be? <clears throat> we, have, we have asked our medical professionals for decades to consider a differential diagnosis of infections, and yet how how do you unravel when you've been re-socialized in medical training? <clears throat> Grandma taught you that a kiss on your knee when you fell off your bike would help. 
How do you then call grandma a quack? How do you then say fungus doesn't cause any health problems? Because you learn that in your medical training. Why? There's 11 antifungals. There's hundreds if not thousands of antibiotics. What does the drug company who trained you, doctor, want you to sell? Antifungals? There's 11 of them. Or antibiotics? All day long. You better write prescriptions for antibiotics. <clears throat> In this case, I think this doctor published, and by the way, there were some people after me who said our profession is really suffering. We're taking a hit. Those patients don't trust us anymore. I hate to think this show is a tiny piece of that because I'm not here to discourage you from trusting your doctor. I'm here to open your eyes to a brand new area that no one's thought about, no one's seen, no one's talking about. Oh, ringworm, you know, jock itch, vaginal yeast, toenail fungus. Okay, that's the extent of their education. Parasites, you're going to be working in America, doctor. You're going to be in Dallas or Los Angeles or Missoula, Montana. People don't live outside. They have homes with sanitation, proper hygiene, etc. You won't need to learn about parasites, and yet there are those of you like me who believe we probably, ever tried sushi once, right? We probably have lots of parasites. These little buggers are probably in the vitreous human humor in our eye, just like fungus. I think most of us have gut candidiasis or gut fungal conditions. I think many of us, if not most, have lung fungal conditions. My dear friend, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, uh, the doctor I helped train up here in Denton, has found so many different fungi, I think 17 different ones in the lungs of these patients who would have previously, 100% of them before I met him three years ago, Dr. Soraya, would have gotten antibiotics. Doctors learn to write antibiotics for everything. And then one day I was a keynote speaker at a medical symposium on mycotoxin and mycotoxicology. And he sat there, it was the coolest thing to watch this doctor. He, he, you can tell when you have an audience that, huh, they're on their cell phone. But you can tell when you've captivated the audience. I generally start out by telling a room of doctors, <clears throat> we humans are exposed to two lethal doses of mycotoxins. What's a mycotoxin? Certain fungi make mycotoxins, a small percentage of fungi do. Ironically, it happens to be the small percentage of the food we're eating. The two most common exposures your patients have had to fungal mycotoxins are alcohol of any kind and antibiotics. You got them. Man, you got them. Now reel them in. Reel them in. What symptoms do we see with chronic mycotoxicosis? You see lumps in the breast. You see a, a, a solid mass on a prostate. You see a patient who can no longer see out of their right eye. Man, they're worried. Is this a glioblastoma? You see migraines and throwing up so bad. Folks, you see bowels that don't move for two days. You see skin like I never saw until I got here to Dallas. I can't believe people can live with skin that bloody and that bad. So let me just read you this graphic that I gave to oncologists. Thank you. <clears throat> so Thursday, we can have a picture of... Uh, of both Sam and Isaac? Yeah. What did he say when he first... So John was gone Thursday because he was at the hospital with his daughter-in-law, and they had an eight-pound... John's a big guy. Eight-pound, two-ounce baby boy. Twelve-ounce? Twelve eight-pound, twelve-ounce? And named Isaac. And little Sam, who was two years old, grabbed him and said, I love you, baby brother. You know, isn't that just... That just now he's going to be throwing cars at him if he and toys at him if he tries to borrow his toys. One more before I... Uh, some antibiotics prescribed during pregnancy are linked to birth defects. Excuse me. Oh, really? They're called macrolides. Biaxin, z -pack.
the educated pregnant woman is worth millions of dollars inside that doctor's office. That doctor didn't learn that in his medical training. If a woman gets infected, and okay, I want to I wanna be as nice as this doctor. What would I do if I were an OBGYN and a woman came to see me who is pregnant and man, she's running a fever? Knowing what I know, I'd say, here's, you know, I took a little, I'm going to put this little thing in your nose and we're going to see what this is. Okay, this is a virus. I think you're shivering and freezing. You got this virus. Would you go home and do me a favor? Take a nice warm bath. I want you to take a couple of grams of vitamin C. I want to introduce you to beta glucan. You know what I'm saying? I, I want you to change your diet. I don't want any grains or sugar in your diet for the next three days. I want to introduce you to maybe some homeopathic remedies. Uh, and I want you to rotate. I want you to take this uh, at 7 in the morning, then this at 3 in the afternoon, then this at 9 at night before you go to bed. I want to rotate these things. I think I'd try and help these women not have to take an antibiotic. Antibiotic is easy schmeasy to prescribe and to swallow. Is it easy schmeasy? Some antibiotics prescribed during pregnancy linked with birth defects. Hate to seem cynical, folks. This show isn't going to stop them. So you have to be sharp. You've got to know when to hold them and know when to say, no. I'm going to go home. I'm going to take, I'll be in touch with you guys tomorrow. I don't want to get this baby sick, but I want to see if there isn't something natural I can do first. And I'm telling you, I'm doing everything in my power to get better, okay? <clears throat> How accurate is your cancer diagnosis? This comes out of a journal called Mycoses, the study of fungus. It was 2014, the journal is uh, number 57. Fungal infections, are you ready? Including paracoccidioideomycoses, histoplasmosis, cryptococcus, coccidioideomycoses, aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and blastomycosis can mimic both the clinical and radiological findings of lung cancer. Then what I put at the bottom, do you doctors know this? No idea. But Doug, what are these? Paracoccidioideomycoses. Well, let's start with histoplasma, right? Histoplasmosis. Folks, that's all over. What about aspergillosis? It's all over. It's ubiquitous. It's in your ducting system. It's on the corn you ate. It's on your bedding. And so these aren't rare fungi. They're mimicking cancer. Fungi grow in a lump. 100% of the lumps, give me my MD degree, thank you very much. I'm going to put that on a plaque behind my desk, shine it up every day. Uh, that says I know what cancer is. This guy was the most humble, that was the most wonderful thing I had ever read. He humbled himself. This woman from El Salvador was right. They were wrong. They may have killed her if they gave her chemo. Then they would have gone, man, she had advanced cancer. That killed her pretty quickly. Wrong. Let them be wrong. Never let them be dead wrong. Shows like this are rare. I understand it. Most of the time it's somebody who's got a product they're going to sell you. The new thing is CBDs and so forth. I love CBD. Um, what I'm trying to do is, is cut to the chase and teach you guys. Pregnant women, be careful with antibiotics. Say no to macrolides. M-A-C-R-O-L-I-D-E-S. Just say no. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is Dan watching on YouTube. Hey, Dan. Uh, Doug, I wrote a few weeks ago regarding my wife's 16-centimeter ovarian cyst. She's been on the Kaufman uh, diet, was given 200 milligrams diflucan, uh, fluconazole for thrush, which coincided with the onset of a bad cough, sore throat, and a fever within a few hours of taking it. Okay, you got that? So she's got her diflucan, and all of a sudden, a fever a sore throat, a bad cough. A few weeks later, 
Uh, it's a few weeks later and she has had two weeks supply of 200 milligrams of fluconazole. She took the first one on Friday and within 24 hours came down with a sore throat, banging headache and generally unwell. She took a further two, I guess she took two more the following days but skipped yesterday altogether because she felt so ill. Dan, I'm not reading this properly probably. Um, it seems as though fluconazole is promoting a die-off or, or an adverse response, and it's mimicking a cold perfectly. And that's, if I had my take on this, she's got a large ovarian cyst. Has she been back to the doctor? Has he now seen it's a 12 or it's a six centimeter cyst? Um, you kind of base things off that. If a diflucan awakens a sleeping giant, either she's having an adverse reaction, an adverse drug event, they're called ADEs, to fluconazole, which I never saw. I never saw. I saw a lot of people get sick when we gave them 200 milligram diflucan. And what I used to tell 100% of them after I got the doctor's approval is this. If you go home and start on my program and you get the cold and you're chilled and you're running a fever and you get a sore throat, um, one of two things. Follow through, but don't take the diflucan anymore. Stay on the diet. Or cut the diflucan. The doctor uh, would score the diflucan, 200 milligram, <coughs> pop it in half, 100 milligram. As you reduce the dose, the die-off lessens and lessens and lessens. Currently, Daniel, a doctor would think, wow, she's reacting to one of the adjuvants in the diflucan. Because I saw this so often, I don't think so. First of all, I just said that fungi make cysts. We know that nasal polyps are due to fungus. Um, and we're talking about all of these papers today, the lung misdiagnoses. 27 people were diagnosed with lung cancer and they didn't have it. They all had lung fungus, grows in lumps. Your wife's ovary, it's got a large cyst on it. Take the antifungal approach and she gets sick. To me, that's really good news. You have awoken a sleeping giant. To her doctor, that might be something different. Here's what I would do. I don't know where we are now on Friday. She took the first one on Friday. A few weeks later, she had, she's had a two-week supply of, I don't get it. She's been on uh, the Kaufman diet and was given, oh, one 200 milligram fluconazole for thrush, which coincided with the onset of a bad cough, one of them, one of them. Now she went back to the doctor and she got a two week supply of fluconazole. She took the first one Friday. Within 24 hours came down with a sore throat. It repeated its action, didn't it? The one pill made her sick, then you went without for a period of time, then you got another one and it made her sick. I've never saw a person allergic to any of the ingredients and God knows what the ingredients of diflucan are. I've never seen that. If the headache, the sore throat, the symptoms are coming on strong. Ask the doctor if you can stop taking the diflucan, continue on the diet for a week. Diet alone will now help starve what has been awoken with the diflucan in her bloodstream. To me, Daniel, having counseled so many people, this is really, really a good indication that she had a tough systemic mycosis, systemic yeast or fungal condition that the diflucan began killing and as we kill a fungal cell with mycotoxins in it, the spores are where the mycotoxins are or in fragments of the cell. That means when we give diflucan and it causes apoptosis, death of the cell, what's inside the cell? Mycotoxins. Oh, Daniel, I feel horrible. I wish you'd have never listened to Doug Kaufman. I wish I could, you know, I used to hear this all the time. Everyone wanted my cell number, you know, to tell me how horrible they felt when they started this. It's rare. One in 25 will go through this. And one of two things happen. She's allergic to diflucan. I never saw it. Or we have awoken a sleeping giant with a pill that only does one thing. Pops open yeast and fungal cells inside her body. Inside those are poisons. And those can induce symptoms of the cold and flu. Dr. Carl Herxheimer first talked about that, a German dermatologist a long time ago. Uh, she took two further the following days, but skipped yesterday altogether because she felt so ill. Thank you, Daniel. I think, 
I would let the doctor know that for a week I'm not going to take any Diflucan. I'm going to drink a lot of liquids, carrot juice, apple ju green apple juice, lots of greens, you know, kale in that. Get over this and see if the diet alone can carry her along. I think in a few days she's going to feel much, much better. Uh, but once we go back on the Diflucan, ask the doctor if you can crack it in half, take half a dose, that'd be roughly 100 milligrams, and I think you'll be quite thrilled with what you see. The die-off won't be anywhere near as severe. This is almost a giveaway to me, Daniel, that that cyst, ovarian cyst, was induced by mold mildew yeast inside her body. Because when we put her on a pill that's just meant to annihilate it, it made her sick. Okay? Good. Thank you so much, and thanks for hanging in there with me, uh, Daniel. Uh, Doug, I want to know, this Bonnie, good afternoon. I want to know, uh, do your books come on ebooks or tapes, CD, et cetera? Yeah, the Fungal Link uh, 1, 2, and 3, the trilogy, Fungus Link 1, 2, and 3, is, I gave away some of them here a few weeks ago, is on CDs. And that's how my friend Dr. Soraya, the pulmonologist in, uh, in Dallas here, once he saw me at the keynote speaker, a doctor works 18 hours a day. He got the CDs, plugged them in his car radio, and while he was driving back and forth, or car stereo, driving back and forth to work, he listened to 30 minutes of these books. And uh, it's a good, good way of learning. We'd love to put them out on uh, e-books one day. We have not done that yet. The books still, it's amazing, you guys. The books fly off the shelf. Wow. Yeah. It is, isn't it? There is, I can't, look, I know you guys always write, thank me, thank you. I learn from you. Debbie says, how can we protect with the flu from China? You guys, if I could, if I could open this up and show you the number of my friends who are doctors that they and I are bouncing back and forth, listen, I'm not going to read it to you. Because I'm going to have to give the doctor's name away. But I just, you know, uh, one of my friends, Cochrane founder, highlights corrupted flu vaccine research. Um, Doug, I thought you might be interested in reading this. Folks, let, can I tell you where I am with this? And Debbie, I don't know. I don't know any more than Wuhan doctors know. I don't know any more than the Center for Disease Control knows. Um, but let me tell you where my heart is. Here's what I do know. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a vaccine. Now, you have to have the antigen. In that case, the H1N1, or you know the swine, or the various strains of viri that go into a flu vaccine. You've got to have those in advance to make the flu vaccine. <clears throat> and uh, it takes years and years and years to do this. I said on this show, if they come up with a vaccine <clears throat> for this, you know, within the next few years, I'm sorry, I just smell a skunk. Somebody had that coronavirus way in advance. And I'm probably wrong here, but somebody had to get the vaccine first and then let the antigen out to the public. And if it's sinister, and I don't know what it is, if it's sinister, this someone would want a, to go to the governments in all these countries and say, we need to mandate this. Because that's what, six billion doses. We're not talking about little doses where people can say, ah, I don't want the flu shot this year. We're talking about mandated global vaccination, six, seven billion vaccines. And I'm so twisted this way, I think, wouldn't it be horrible if there was something in that vaccine that they gave to all of us that we could then be identified with? I mean, isn't that crazy? Um, however, if the vaccine comes on the market a year from now, they rushed it through, and it's not mandated, go to your doctor. You know my feeling on it. 
uh, go to your doctor and get your vaccine, right. I'll drive by, what's that pharmacy, CHS or CVS? You drive by the pharmacy and it always says, hey, we have you know, cigarettes, tobacco. They got rid of their tobacco, then they got rid of their alcohol, I think, but they still got all sorts of candy in there. And oh, by the by, thousands of drugs. And I see a sign that says, come on in, get your coronavirus vaccine today. Look, I'm an American. I'm free to say, no, I don't think that's for me. If it, become, if it comes on the market in 2020 and it becomes mandated for mankind, we must save mankind. I'm suspect, that's all. This might be a real problem, folks. <clears throat> it might be a real problem. But if you're my age, you have been real problemed medically to death. We were all supposed to be dead in the year 1988 from HIV. We're all supposed to be dead. We were all exposed to it. And then there was a the swine flu. And then we see uh, another friend of mine <clears throat> sent me an article from a medical news thing that said, well, we're on par this year. We got moderate results with the flu vaccine for 2019. What's moderate results? They were patting themselves on the back. It was 45%. Were you in high school? Did you take college? Do you remember the teacher <clears throat> coming up to you and saying, Mary, you got a 45 on your test. That's pretty moderate. Way to go. You got an F. Even if it was 15 percentage points higher than that, you got an F. We're, we're being brainwashed into thinking a 40 or 45 vaccine that's moderate. What's lousy? If a 45% is moderate, what's lousy? Just saying. Trust has always been my issue. <clears throat> I've worked in medicine for so many years, and there are many, many good people in medicine. But there are statisticians who sometimes can convert the truth to looking like, you know, to making it look like the truth when it's not really. Okay, so how do we protect ourselves from the flu in China? Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell you what I did. I still, because it's cold weather outside, here in Dallas anyway, and I'm 20 milligrams a day of beta-glucan. I then began to study uh, aloe vera, the immunomodulation associated with aloe vera, and I've added one aloe vera here. This is it, aloe apex. Inexpensive aloe apex. Um, and these are dietary supplements, uh, immune system, inflammation, digestion. You guys are swearing about this product. Um, Premier aloe vera, organic aloe vera. So it's made by a company called Aloe Apex. I've added one of those a day. I'm really careful with the exception of bubble gum today at the barber shop. I'm really careful of sugar or any grains in my diet. I don't smoke, I don't drink any alcohol, I don't do soda pops, uh, so I'm very cautious. I exercise and I sweat, even though it was in the 40s. I really sweat. These are all things I think we need to do. We detoxify our body by sweating. Good question, Debbie, thank you. And please don't let this show, fear kills, you know? Fight or flight, the adrenal glands, adrenaline, fear kills. And in medicine, we use fear to our benefit. <gasps> you didn't get the flu vaccine. Don't let that happen. Women have intuitive natures. I think some men do too. I'm not one of them. But women get a pretty good gut check uh, on this whole flu, this whole new coronavirus. I don't know how bad it is in Wuhan. I'm sad. I mean, a lot of people... Uh, the same flu statistic that told me it's 45% effective said something like 9,000 people died last year of the flu. I think there are 70,000 people with this Wuhan coronavirus and 800 of them have died. I'm so lost, folks. I don't know who to believe. We're all going home one day, okay? Can't avoid that. Good questions. Jeannie. Uh, what would be wrong with someone that can't eat much anymore and nothing tastes good to them? What would be wrong to some? So the first thing, so in other words, I used to eat a lot, says Jeannie. I used to love my food, uh, but now I can't eat much anymore and nothing tastes good. One of two things have happened. We talked about this last week. Pressure on the olfactory bulb 
the nose, uh, a, a cranial nerve that, that enables smell and taste. Uh, if there's pressure or inflammation, edema, on the olfactory bulb, you can't taste anything, nothing tastes good to you, and so you don't thrive. You begin, uh, you know, you just don't eat much anymore. Um, I mean, I would go to a near nose and throat doctor and just get that ruled out. Do you find yourself talking like that? You're stuffed up all the time? Uh, do you have a sinus infection? A sinus infection and failure to thrive, failure to eat, kind of go hand in hand in a lot of people. Hope that helps. <laughs> um, this John, John thinks I'm much smarter than I am. I want to read you this. You know, I always laugh. I was laughing about a paper that came out today in medicine, and it's all acronyms. The way this drug that you can't pronounce suppresses the TFDO MBLOX2K gene, impressing on the PLXYN DOCA modified gene. What? And so John says, Doug, what do you think of the high TGF beta 1 and high MMP9 is related to lots of fungus in the body? Do you think that? I have had help with Sporinox, but I feel Candida is playing a role, and my TGF beta 1 and MM9 is high. Thanks, Doug. I agree with you on drugs doctors give you, like fluoroquinolones. They're candy, yeah. So uh, I'm going to have to do a little homework on this. Um, you know, and, and uh, John, I'll get back with you. I'm, I am totally enthralled that you think I am this smart. This reminds me, John, of now I'm live, right? I, if had I had time to study that, I would have put it on TV and said, yes, we all know what the uh, TGF uh, transforming growth factor, I think, beta-1 transforming growth factor. I would have taken time and studied that. This reminds me, John, of when I used to work with these doctors, and uh, they'd bring a patient and say, Doug, she's suffering from uh, XYZ fragmented cell genetic uh, problem. I'd say, okay. You know, I'd stand there. I'd say, okay, yeah. Um, and I want you to take a look at her, see if you can help her. So the first thing when the doctor left, I, I would say, how does this genetic factor uh, express itself in you? Well, you know, like any TFS genetic factor, I get ringing in my ear. Ah, now I know what to help you with. Uh, it's medicine folks, the legal beagles have their own language, right? Medicine has their own language. This is so we can't walk in a room sitting there half naked, you know, on a, on a, a roll-up bed, and we can't understand what they're saying to each other. Amazing. So I'll work on that, John. I'll get back with you. Oh, Deborah, Deborah, Deborah. This is Deborah from Los Angeles. I understand you're coming to an event here next week, and I would love the opportunity to meet you and discuss a big idea I have regarding what you teach. Um, Deborah, the event... I'm not going to be speaking at it, thank you, um, and I'm going to be attending it because I need, for your betterment, all of you, I need to get out there and see what new products are. This is called Expo West. It's not open to the public. It's open, uh, you know, to the media. People like me get to go in and see a thousand new supplements and businesses and uh, learn about them. I am not, Deborah. I'm not meeting with anyone out there. I'm going out with my wife, our son, his wife, and their two dogs. Uh, we finally get to see their new home up in the mountains up there in Los Angeles, and it's really beautiful. Uh, so I'm not, I, why don't you private message me, and we'll take it from there. That'd be kind of cool. Wow, this, uh, Junae, I had no idea. Hello, Doug and KTC crew. I'm Rehabilitating for my strength I lost when I had a bladder infection. I'm working. Had any thoughts of how I could regain my strength faster? Wow. You know, um, bladder infections, you know, I've been blessed. I've never had one. But bladder infections, I'm told, really do take it all out of you. Um, let me, Junae, here's the way Doug works. 
when I have something, and it used to be diet, if I didn't follow my own diet, I'd be so tired and so ornery and so, you know, worn out all the time. I went, I found out that if I exercise hard uh, for 20 to 30 minutes, that brings me out of my funk. Uh, but that was a diet induced. This was an infection induced. You could be dying off of all this, whatever it was, bacterial strains, fungal strains, etc. Boy, John, you want to keep me. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, uh, you're riding the good ride right now. Um, you'll get over this. This too shall pass as these bacteria or fungi exit your body. I would work toward that end with known, you know, things like garlic. Uh, and resveratrol, things that are on the market. This book, plant-derived anti-mycotoxins, anti antimycotics, antifungals, it's a tremendous book. Uh, it says that green foods and onion-based uh, foods and garlic uh, and thing, oregano, spices, have antimycotic properties. So rotate your supplements, try as you may to get out and just walk. You'll be amazed at how good you'll feel after that. Got to get back into an exercise program. Listen to this. This is so amazing because we had this. Thank you, Lynn. Doug, I took fluconazole tablets, broke out in whelps and blisters on my body. It is killing the yeast, or is this an allergic reaction? It's on my upper back, uh, upper chest, top of upper legs. Thank you. Lynn, I'll tell you uh, what I told uh, Dan and that is, I don't know. I never once saw. How would you know you didn't see one, Doug? Because these people went off Diflucan, stayed on my diet, and gradually Dr. Weekly would put them on 50, 100, and 200 milligram Diflucan. And we got to follow these people for six months or so. And when they went on the tiny dose, the 50, they began feeling better. We'd bump it up to 100 for a couple days. Oh, boy, Doug, I'm getting these blisters again. Back it down to 50. If this is a die-off, Lynn and Daniel's wife, you've got this bad. I saw it from time to time. But I never saw what I thought was an allergic reaction. Now, with whelps, blisters, I'd do some Googling and look at the ingredients and wonder about that. I never, I don't know what health problems you had and why... You know, they put you on Diflucan. Thank God these doctors are doing this. But we're going to see. Unfortunately, doctors start everybody out with 200 milligram instead of maybe 100. We're going to see some die-off. And whelps and blisters might be a dermatophyte, a skin fungi. There are these uh, genuses of skin fungi. Odiomyphitin, uh epididiomyphitin, trichomyphitin, uh, skin fungi that can live in the layers of skin. And so you may have really awoken a sleeping giant. I have to wonder, Lynn, if it was a dermatologist you went to who gave you the fluconazole for a skin problem. Um, it could be an allergic reaction. Here's how you test that. I'd let my doctor know that what you're going to do is go off Diflucan for a week. Then you're going to crush one up with a mortar pestle and you're going to take a toothpick, and you're going to put that much of a Diflucan in a glass of water, stir it up, and drink it down. No reaction. Next day, quarter to an eighth of a Diflucan. And if nothing happens, that was probably a huge die-off to a 200 milligram Diflucan. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Daniel. Both of you opened the eyes of myself and the audience. Uh, Annette, okay, hey from Greece. Hi, Annette. Thank you for joining us. I just want to share that when I want to know something about health issues, I just Google, what does Doug Kaufman say about blank? Uh, does that work? We got to try that. I, I think I, thank you, Annette. I need to show my wife how very important I am. No, uh, no ego here, but that's what does Doug Kaufman say about. Thank you so much, and thank you for watching from Greece. We have so many people from so many other countries watching this show. I am humbled. Can you recommend a doctor, asked Sally, who might be able to give my brother a prescription for Sporinox in Austin, Texas? He has lung cancer. Boy, oh boy, oh 
boy, man, one of the studies on an antifungal called thiabendazole was done at the University of Austin. Beautiful place out there. And you know, you'd think there'd be many doctors open to this. Hmm. I only know, uh, the, the two doctors I know in Austin that would do that, I have sent people to them. They're booked for 90 days. You can't get in to see them for 90 days. Folks, that's how much interest, and Annette, that's how much interest there is in mold, mildew, and fungus right now. It's become huge. 50 years ago when I started all this, shh, nobody. Today, I think I've induced a Herxheimer on fungus. I think I've, okay, so if I lived in Austin, Texas, I would get a flight to Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia, and I would see a doctor out there by the name of Jonathan Stegall, $200 flight, Jonathan Stegall, S-T-E-G-A-L, I think, or is it two L's, Jonathan Stegall, he's an oncologist, he is an a integrative oncologist, um, and they do things a little bit differently. In his book, he wrote a book that's selling very well, just look on Amazon, Jonathan Stegall, MD. He mentions me and my work, the antifungal approach in his book. He has lung cancer. Man, Sally, Sally, he needs to drive and go see Dr. Soraya and get a bronchoscopy done. I would go to Denton, Texas and see Dr. Mukesh Soraya. S-A-R-I-A-Y-A, uh, -A -A, Soraya. Mukesh Soraya. I'd get a bronchoscopy done. What This doctor's done thousands of these. I'll bet what he's going to find is lung fungus. Man, I'm so glad I went over that article, 27 misdiagnosed lung cancers. Um, so I'd see Dr. Soraya, and if Dr. Soraya says, yeah, this is fungus, he'll prescribe the antifungus. He doesn't have to go all the way out there. I drive to Austin almost every week to see the grandkids, so it's a long drive, but be well worth it. Sally, please, Dr. Saraya, S-A-R-A-I-Y-A. -A -I -I -A. Um, good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, and I have a good friend, and they talk about put, putting cement in her back pain. Cement in her back pain. And I want to know if you've ever heard of doing that before. No. I got to tell you, and Bonnie, you probably know this. I see your name in here a lot. Long story, really short. Decades ago, I helped a woman with migraine headaches. As was the case so often, two weeks later, they'd come back and they'd be teary. They'd be crying. They can't believe their skin problem, their tummy problems, their sinus problem. In her case, her pain was gone. When she came back in two weeks, she brought her husband, a guy by the name of Jim. Turns out, Jim wanted to meet me. I didn't know he was a doctor. And he said, we have been working on my wife's migraines for decades. For two weeks, she has had no migraines. She's been on two antifungal medicines and your diet. What are you doing? Later, he invited me to the hospital. He was the chief orthopedist. You cannot believe how good a drug called Nystatin. He wouldn't prescribe Diflucan. The hospital said no. But a gut antifungal drug called Nystatin, New York State in, N-Y-S-T-A-T-I-N. Nystatin and the Kaufman diet did for people in pain. So before I'd put cement in my back, I've never heard of that, do you got a month? Can you give me, if not Nystatin, could you give me resveratrol rotated with olive leaf? One week olive leaf, next week uh, resveratrol, next week olive leaf. Next. Could you do that and stay on the Kaufman diet and tell me if your back isn't 50 to 100% better in 30 days? Um, okay, so Pat, that's my friend Pat. Hi, Doug. I'm wondering if corn fiber as an ingredient in keto chocolate is bad. Nothing shocks me. It is like, is it like eating corn? Yeah, it's a fiber in corn which I know is bad. The chocolate has no sugar. It's sweetened with stevia. That's good, but corn fiber is just that. Okay, I got to tell you guys something. I go into health food stores like you do. I am blown away when I pick up a package of keto or 
you know, and I look at the ingredients. Sometimes you have to dig, and always, I might invent a telescope that you can use in .1 font lettering to read the ingredients in some of these things. But when I see corn fiber or sugars under different names, if they're weaving through what they're putting on the label, I mean, keto was none of this. Corn is a grain. Grains are gone from the keto diet. Stevia is a plant that tastes sweet. Love it. But in my humble opinion, corn fiber, as I know it, shouldn't ever, ever be an ingredient in keto, anything keto. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, I've learned, uh, hello, Doug, does heavy metal toxicity and fungus go hand in hand. I believe it does. I believe they're concomitant problems. The metals damage your gut defenders and the sugar in your diet leading to fungus toxicity overgrowth. Um, so are, my, are the symptoms from heavy metal toxicity, are they really from fungal overgrowth? I have lectured for years about Lyme disease or fungus, heavy metal hypertoxicity or fungus. It's so hard to rule out Lyme, years of antibiotics. It's so hard to rule out metal toxicity. DMPS, other IVs to get rid, to chelate out these metals. Why wouldn't you go on a Kaufman diet and maybe try and get some Diflucan and Nystatin for a month? You're going to know in a month if this was the way to go. Oh, wow, Tim, can you briefly touch on candida osteomyelitis? I was looking at a case study of 206 patients. 60% of those, it had localized in the right femoral head, right femoral head up here in your hip. Does it start in the gut and spread out? Yeah, fungus, Tim, is known to disseminate. Once dissemination initiates, it is pumped indiscriminately by the ticker to anywhere in your body. What fascinates me is learning about shock organs, my left eye, uh, maybe your right hip, maybe your lower back, maybe your brain, uh, maybe, you know, your skin. Fungus seems to land in vulnerable tissue, shock organs sometimes. So I haven't read that study, but candida osteomyelitis, any doctor would say yeast doesn't cause osteomyelitis. Tim will tell you in 60% of the cases what he read, it does. My point being, and thank you, Tim, for this. You're an angel to others. You just helped someone who is asking about having cement put in her back. Is that a viable option? Now I hope you've just introduced her to, hmm, my pain might be fungus. You guys rock. Thank you so much. I'll see you Thursday at 2.30. Tell a friend. Bye-bye.